I am literally just catapulted out of my body and I am turned around standing with three people that I didn't know. I'm standing with an Asian man, an Egyptian woman, and a Hawaiian man. And I am facing my body in the ladder suspended in the air. And once again, I'm in this blissful, timeless space. I'm feeling all of this unconditional love. And they said to me, what do you wanna do, Michelle? Do you wanna stay or do you wanna go? And I was trying to understand because I, in my mind, was saying my body's gonna hit the floor in less than a second, but they were not rushing me to decide. I'd like to welcome to the show, Michelle Clare. Thanks for being here, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me, Rod. I'm absolutely fascinated to hear about your story, about your NDEs and, and how you're working with spirit now. But could you just give us a little bit of your background, what life was like growing up for you and when and if you had a spiritual awakening, what that was like as well? Yeah, so I was raised Catholic and from a very young age, I believed in the angels and the saints and that I had this whole universe of people, light beings that were really, really wanting to help me and support me on my journey. So that was very beneficial for me. I will tell you, though, in first grade when my dog died and I went to Sunday school and my teacher told me my dog didn't go to heaven because it didn't have a soul. That was the first time I started oh. realizing this might not be the right fit for me, because even at that age, I knew that, that my dog was safely home in that heavenly realm. So that's really how I was raised. But what happened was when my grandfather passed away, I was 12 years old. And at that point in time, after he passed, he would come through and give me messages and I would share them with my mom. And my mom would say, well, Michelle, that's what you think he would say if he was still here. So I quickly realized not everyone was having these conversations with grandpa. And I just started to keep it to myself. Thanks. Thanks for your support there, there, mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did that present itself to you? Was it just like a, a, a voice in your head or a vision or how did that work? Yeah, so it would come, um, I could feel his presence. I would have dream visits with him. So sometimes I would feel him next to me and I could feel the message or hear what he was saying. And what I just realized was that was going to be my relationship with him and I was going to kind of keep it private because nobody else was open to that. But I would feel him sometimes give me messages for my mom. And when I would go to share those with her, she was always uncomfortable. She just didn't understand it and didn't know exactly how to process it. Yeah, I, I think this is a thing, isn't it? Especially, I think there's more and more children who are being born, you know, in the last decade or two that have, have these experiences, that have this sort of awakening, this it's like the veil between them and the spirit world is much, much thinner. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's why it's important that, that we talk about what we're talking about right now, I think, so that more and more people, it becomes more and more accepted. And when it does come up, um, you know, I was thinking like the fact that your mum didn't really understand, did that sort of deter you or did, did that sort of make you want to like shut down that particular aspect of you? Yeah, it absolutely did, because I didn't think I was safe to share it with anyone because my own mom, even though she loved me and I loved her, wasn't really open to it. So it really became just this private thing where I thought, OK, this is just between me and grandpa. Um, and I never looked for it to expand to be with anyone else or expected that. So it was it was a little bit disheartening because at that point he was the closest person in my life that I had had that had transitioned. And I didn't really realize that no one else was having these conversations. Mm. How did Grandpa explain himself? You mentioned that there's a feeling like you knew that it was him just by a sort of a, a intuitive knowing and feeling. Did he have to explain himself when he first came through? It's like, hey, it's actually me. It's Grandpa. No, I actually just knew exactly who he was. I, mm. I could feel him. I had a visual in my mind's eye. And I could understand everything he was saying to me. So it was it was very, I, one thing that was beautiful, it was never scary for me. It was like, oh, it's grandpa. He's still communicating. So I know you've had a, a few NDAs. So I'd love to talk to you about those. Can you sort of go through in chronological order what happened there? Yeah, absolutely. So before my first NDE, my grandmother also transitioned. And when she transitioned, 
same thing happened with her. I was having these visits with her. The messages were coming through. I'd share them with my mom. My mom would say the same thing. Well, that's what you would think she would say. So again, I just learned to keep this relationship to myself, but I'm very much aware that this is happening. So as time goes on, in April of 2000, I have my first near-death experience. And in that point in time, I'm, um, I had only been married a few years. I didn't have kids yet. We were in the hospital visiting my sister-in-law who had had a baby that day and her RN happened to be my friend from high school. So I was in the hallway talking to her RN and at that point in time, I had a massive seizure. And so what I remember is opening my eyes and I was laying in this beautiful white room and the walls were alive and breathing. It was like every cell or molecule in there was radiating this light and love. And even though they seemed solid, I knew they were full of light. And as I'm laying in this room, I look up and I see my beautiful grandma holding my head in her lap. And she was the youngest, healthiest version of her that I could remember. And I just remember feeling the timelessness, the bliss, this unconditional love. And as I was really soaking it in, I noticed that standing next to my grandma was this angel that was about 12 feet tall. And as I looked at her, it was as though I had been kind of almost pulled into her energy. And I remember thinking, what is your name? And she answered me. She said, my name is Madeline and I'm your guardian angel. I was really surprised because at that point in my life, I didn't know anything about telepathic communication. So I didn't know how she was reading my thoughts. I remember I wanted to see her wings because we all know that angels have these big feather wings. And when I went to look for them, what I realized was they were actually made out of light and they were kind of iridescent and translucent. And they moved a little bit like the Aurora Borealis across the sky. And there was no end to these wings. They literally almost seemed to span eternity. So I was just laying here in this beautiful, blissful space, not wanting to leave, not worried about anything. And the next thing I hear is someone yelling, code, code, code. And I am shoved back in my body. And it felt like I had dropped out of a 10-story building. It was hard. It was heavy. My arm felt like it weighed 500 pounds. And I was just back. And so after this experience, they admitted me to the hospital. They never found out why I had the seizure. I've never had another one again. But it took me a few weeks to even process what had happened because I did not know the term near-death experience. I didn't really have anyone that I could talk to about this. But I remember that I had never felt so loved in my life. A few weeks after this happened, I shared it with my mom and my mom was kind of looking at me, trying to understand how this could happen. She knew that, that I felt that it was real. And actually what near-death experiencers often say is it feels more real in that experience than it does when we're here on planet Earth. And that was absolutely true for me. And so my mom knew I had an experience, but she never knew what to make of it. Wow. So... Did I get this right? So you were actually in the hospital when the seizure occurred. Well, that was pretty handy, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> very convenient. <laughs> yeah. And did you have a moment of, uh, oh, God, I've died, or how did I get here, or where am I? Or was it just like, did it feel familiar at all? It felt so familiar and so comfortable. Um, I So in none of my NDEs have I seen this tunnel of light coming for me. I am always just here and then I am gone. And so I think our souls process getting to the other side differently. And for me, it's literally just like blinking and I'm there. But it was so familiar, so comfortable, so loving. Um, there was no part of me that was worried about anything or wanting to leave. Mm. Yeah, I have a theory about that. What I've noticed is that people who uh, have been you know, conscious of spirit from an earlier age, at least in my limited experience talking to people, is that they tend not to have the tunnel experience, whereas those who had not, you know, been, uh, didn't ever get messages, weren't ever connected to spirit in any sort of meaningful way, tend to have the tunnel thing. And maybe that just makes more sense for them, for things to be constructed that way for them, because I, what I do believe is that everybody has a unique 
in year that's unique to them, that's specially tailored for them. So maybe Absolutely. it's something to do with the fact that you're kind of used to the whole idea. So they go, oh, well, let's just skip that bit. We'll just get straight. Get you straight right. There. We can, <laughs> we'll skip the tunnel. I'll just go right there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you had two other NDAs, right? So you've had one more recently and you had one. Tell us about the other two. Yes. So the next one happened in May of 2006. And at that point in my life, I was married. I had three little kids. So I had a five-year-old, a two-and-a-half-year-old, and an infant. When I had my son in April, I had had a lot of complications with him. So I was in the hospital about four out of the six weeks after I had him. And the doctors finally said, we need to do a DNC on you. And that's a process where they clear out your uterus. Mm -hmm. It's outpatient, but they said, this should, this should take care of the problem. You'll be able to go home and it'll just be fine. So I was ready to go home. I was sick of being in the hospital. And the night before the procedure, I just had this pit in my stomach and I knew that I should not go through with this, but they had made it sound so easy and so simple in 45 minutes and I'd be headed home. So the next morning when I went in, I talked to the doctor and the anesthesiologist. Once again, they both reassured me that it would be easy and simple. And I have had anesthesia before, before this procedure. And whenever I've had it, it was just a blank space. I didn't have dreams. I didn't have memories. There was nothing. So in this situation, I remember counting backwards for the anesthesiologist. And the next thing I know, I am opening my eyes in the operating room on the gurney. And I look over and my beautiful 102-pound white German shepherd who had passed away a few years before came walking in. She laid her head on the operating table and the next thing I knew, we were gone. And we were on this phenomenal beach. There were colors that we don't have here on planet Earth. There were sounds, there were emotions, there were smells. Everything on this beach, every cell, every molecule, every drop of water, every piece of sand is radiating this light and love and bliss. And I just remember soaking in this moment. And as I am, I'm looking at my beautiful German shepherd. Her name was Tahoe. And she is looking like she's about two years old. She's young. She's healthy. We are telepathically communicating. She's so happy that I'm there. And we are just running on this amazing beach. And as we're running, I start to notice that I'm not getting tired. I'm not getting hot. I'm not getting thirsty. The sand feels like clouds. And I start to have this realization that something is definitely different, surrounded by all of this bliss. At that moment, I feel my son, who was six weeks old, and he was at the house with my mom, calling to me because he knew I was getting ready to leave. In this near-death experience, this is the place where I realized our souls can be in more than one place at a time because there was this part of me on the beach with my dog and this other part of me that goes to my son. And I remember him and I remember his fear because he was six weeks old. And I remember saying, Josh, I will find a way to stay. And I didn't know what to do. So I started praying and I started saying, it's not my time. I need help. I'm not ready. My kids still need me. And the next thing I know, I'm immediately back in the operating room. Jesus comes in. And Jesus came in as like your best friend, your best buddy, like, hey, I'm here. How can I help you? This operating room lights up with this beautiful white light. And the next thing I know, I'm waking up in post-op and my 45-minute procedure turned into a three and a half hour emergency surgery because they had ruptured my uterus in two places wow. and missed my artery by a millimeter. Wow. Wow, those DNC operations, the only reason I know about that is because I actually had another guest almost a year ago who had the same thing, they had an NDE mm -hmm. because she had a DNC. I'm not saying there's anything particularly systemic about DNCs, but it's just interesting that you're the second person I've heard talk about that. That is interesting. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay, so... All right. Well, we've got uh, now. You've got. There's another one. You're, you're, you're the one first more. person who's had three NDEs. <laughs> is incredible. Right. All right. Tell us about the third one. Yeah. You know why have one or two when you can have three, right? But I keep yeah. telling everyone, I'm done now. I figure my next exit point is I'm out. So whenever that comes, I'm going. Uh, my third one happened on November 1st, 2011. So for people who like numbers, that's 11 one eleven. Wow. At that point in my life, I had my three little kids. So. 
they were five, eight, and 10. And I have 14 foot ceilings in my house. So up above about 12 feet off the ground, I have these battery operated candles. And I told my younger two kids who are home, I'm going to change the batteries and then we're going to go get your sister. So I remember climbing to the top of the ladder. And as I got to the top, I felt it start to shift. And I remember thinking, oh, this is going to hurt. And at that moment, I am literally just catapulted out of my body. And I am turned around standing with three people that I didn't know. I'm standing with an Asian man, an Egyptian woman, and a Hawaiian man. And I am facing my body in the ladder suspended in the air. And once again, I'm in this blissful, timeless space. I'm feeling all of this unconditional love. And they said to me, what do you want to do, Michelle? Do you want to stay or do you want to go? And I was trying to understand because I, in my mind, was saying my body's going to hit the floor in less than a second, but they were not rushing me to decide. I had forever to make this decision. It was like a freeze frame in a movie, right? Just my body and the ladder suspended in the air. And as I was watching that, I saw a different angel than the first one come in and this angel was dressed in red and gold. And the moment that I saw this angel, I had this knowing that this angel was either going to take me straight home to heaven or shift something so that I could stay. And as I was in that space, just kind of soaking it in, I remember seeing my two younger kids in the kitchen. And the minute that I saw them, I knew I needed to commit to staying. And as I made that decision, I was downloaded with a bunch of information um, from my life guides from Source. Uh, it was really this moment where they said to me, okay, Michelle, you can stay, but you need to go back and you need to do your mediumship the way that you do it. And you need to you know, help people and, and, and be that light. And they, they explained to me, they said, your marriage is probably not going to survive this and you have more trauma that's going to come in your life. And they were absolutely correct about all of these things. And yet in that moment, seeing my kids, it was just like, oh, I'm not done here. So what happened was I ended up falling. I hit the corner of the island in the kitchen with oh. the back of my head. And yes. I had a five and a half inch skull fracture that went up. I had a brain bleed over here. I lost my taste, my smell, my equilibrium. But I actually ended up surviving the fall by literally half an inch because that was how much I had missed my brainstem by. And that was what kept me here. Gosh. So when you, I'm just looking at the practicalities. So the kids were there, who, did somebody, how did that work? Did one of the, oh, I guess because you had slightly older kids, the oldest one would have been old enough to call 911. Oh, that's so, a hey, great story. Ahead. Let's dive into that for a minute. That's okay. actually, a, that's an amazing story. So, what happened, my five-year-old son, Josh, um, had tried to call 911, but he thought his call didn't go through. So um, what, after about 10 days, I got out of the hospital and I came home and I had a lot of recovery. I mean, years of recovery, but about the end of January 2012, my son started getting really depressed because he said, Mom, I didn't do anything to help you. My call didn't go through. And I would say, but Josh, you opened the door for the policeman. Help was coming. And he just kept getting more and more depressed at five. So the end of January, my grandfather, who passed away when I was 12 years old, came through to me and he talked to me about the accident. He talked to me about my son. They've never walked this earth at the same time. And he said something about my son being good with electronics. And then he said to me, Michelle, you need to get the 911 recording. There's something on there that you should know. And I didn't even know I could get that. So I went down. This is my first huge mediumship visit too after the wow. head injury. Okay, I'm getting chills. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I go, I order the 911 recording. It takes a couple of weeks to come in. I get it. I play it. And I hear them say, 911, what's your emergency? And in his little broken voice, my son Josh says, Sophie, what do I say? And then he laid the phone down because he had called right when the trauma happened and he actually had forgotten that the call went through. So for a minute and a half, you can hear the operators trying to get the kid's attention. Mm. And then my son says, I'm going to go push the panic alarm button on the house. And my daughter says, hold on, let me try calling 911. She hangs up the phone, recalls, and her call went through too. 
So when he came home from kindergarten that day, I just said to him, I said, Josh, your call went through. Help was coming. And it was as though I had lifted this 10,000 pound weight off this little boy. And the gift of this was, what I really realized at that moment was the true gift of mediumship. My grandfather from the other side had life-changing information that I didn't even know existed. And he was still connected to my son, whom he never even met in human form, but came through with information to change his life. Wow, that's amazing. I'm going to be, well, I, I've got, I'm going to be doing a bit of this today, I think. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the download that you got while you were during your NDE, you know, what, what did that contain? What were, what were the instructions that you got? Yeah, so some of it is still revealed to me over time. Um, I don't think that I can remember all of it because it was so multi-layered. But um, basically what I was told was that I was going to survive. I was going to be able to, to, you know, live to raise my kids, that I was going to lose my marriage, which is true. After 25 years, my marriage ended in divorce. They told me that I was going to have more trauma coming. And if they told me the specifics of that, I don't remember it. But um, what has happened also since then is that my life partner transitioned by suicide in August. So there was definitely oh, more trauma with that. Um, and that what they really told me was like, just to take the next step on my path, because I didn't know um, how to how all of this was going to unfold at that point in time. And honestly, that first year, I had so much physical damage that I was trying to heal from. I mean, just being able to stand up and walk uh, that I couldn't really focus on how am I going to learn to be a medium? I was just trying to be a mom. But with time, the pieces kept coming into place. And one thing that I've really learned from spirit is that it, it really is, especially for me, about having just the faith to take the next step, even though I might not know exactly what that looks like, it will present itself at the right time. Mm. There was something you said then about you were there's this the the law of free will I call it the law because I've been reading um, the law of one books for probably about nine months now and the one thing that's really hit home to me is that the uh, this free will that we're given is absolutely fundamental to our experience and that anything that might impinge on our free will is is really to be avoided when it comes to especially when it comes to spirit so when I think about that, it's like you were given a little bit of information, but it wasn't enough to, you've still got your free will about how you do that. But I think when you start getting specifics about this is going to happen, that's going to happen, that's going to happen. I feel like that starts to then intrude upon your free will in, in a way. So it makes sense to me that you wouldn't be given those sort of specifics. And having right. said that, I know, I know that sometimes people get premonitions about things as well. And I think there's this sort of this, this fine line that spirit sometimes treads, I feel like, between free will and it's like, well, this is a probability, you know, but it's not necessarily going to impinge on your free will if I give you this information. Yeah, absolutely. I, I came back knowing without a doubt that the deal was I would follow through with my mediumship if I was coming back again. Um, mm. and, it, and it was clearly worth it to me. We have free will on a soul level and we have free will on a human level. So our, no one's soul is here accidentally or against their w will. I believe in pre-life planning. So I believe that our souls create blueprints and we have ideas and missions and things we want to learn and accomplish. And then we come in, right? So our soul chose to be here. And then on top of that, we, we picked a blueprint for our life. And then we come in and our humanness has free will also. So how did your abilities evolve after that India? Did things change for you then? They did not change immediately. I mean, the visit that I had with my grandfather when he told me about the 911 recording was the most vivid, brilliant visit I had ever had up until that point in time. But I started getting a little scared. So I went to a counselor and the spirit would have me have it. They took me to the right counselor who said, oh, Michelle, what a gift. Let's get you a mentor. And I wasn't really sure it was a gift at this point in time. So then I found a mentor and I started training with different people. And I did that for quite a few years. What was happening was information was coming through from spirit, but I didn't feel like I had control over it. It would just come in out of the blue. And so I didn't know how to do it on demand. Um, and, and with the mentoring, I really was able to train it and hone into it. 
Mm. And so how how does your I, mediumship in particular I find absolutely fascinating. And uh, I know for some people it's like a blending that occurs. Some people really have to sort of step aside, like people like Riz Mirza really sort of steps aside and others, um, other people I've spoken to, it's not, it's not like that at all and it comes with their experience. So how does... How does spirit come through with you, especially when you're getting messages? Yeah, so most of my information comes through feelings. And I like to describe that as looking at someone that you know well and you know exactly what they're going to say before they say it. It's just there. When I'm working with mediumship, I will feel the number three. I'll feel the color blue. I'll feel that grandpa felt like he was 5'10". So it's really about feelings. Sometimes I will see things, hear things, or physically feel things too. Wow. So you've got to translate a feeling into something that a person that you're talking to can actually understand. Yes. Yeah. Did it take, was that, is that just practice? Like, do you keep getting better with that or how did you, how did you evolve that skill? Yeah. So I did, I just started practicing. I started working with different mentors and then I actually spent one year before I went into business doing this professionally, telling everyone I knew, send me anyone, you know, that I don't know that wants a reading so that I can just read them and make sure I'm getting accurate information. And it was really about building that trust within myself that the information was good. And then the other thing that I did was I actually became a certified medium. And the way that that is done, um, what happens is you have five blind readings. So they would tell me, log on Skype Wednesday morning at 11. I would log on to a blank screen and I would just start saying, okay, I have a young male here who died of traumatic brain injury and start giving information. And the person on the other side of the screen is actually scoring you and giving you points. So after you do five and you pass them, then you're officially certified. Wow, I didn't even know that that was... That was a thing. Yes, it is a thing. I know. I I, I think it's amazing too because there are a lot of great mediums who aren't certified or haven't been vetted. But for somebody who's starting and doesn't know where to go, it's always great to start with somebody that actually has, you know, credibility. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess it's good. I mean, it's it adds this sort of element of trust, especially for people who may not have ever spoken to a medium before, knowing knowing that you've you've been through that sort of testing and training. Mm-hmm. Um, now, before we, we got on the air, we were talking about whether there were, I've only recently started speaking to mediums like I mentioned to you before we, we got on, uh, hit the record button. And sometimes I've had my guests have messages come through for me or for, for someone in my, my family. Um, so I don't, I know that your you sort of the process for you is a little different. I'm just wondering whether anything has been coming through while we've been having our conversation. You know, yeah, there actually is. So I don't know who has the stronger connection to water, you or your brother, but there's a really strong connection to water. So I, I need to acknowledge that. I also need to acknowledge him saying that he, okay, he taps you on the shoulder. So there's something about when you're with the water, whether you're at the ocean or at the beach or whatever you're doing, are you a surfer? Are you out there in the water? Um, no, whatever no, I just, this is. I just really like it and I've never been able to really understand why. And, we, and I should point out my, for, because, because we talked about this before I hit the record button, my brother passed away when he was 18 years old, about 30 years ago in a car accident. So now people know who you're talking about when you say my brother. Okay. He, um, he's telling me he taps you on the shoulder. So that connection with water is also connection with him. So I feel like you'll get more messages or insights from him when you're around the water. But he's also talking about sending you a lot of music and a lot of songs. So pay attention to what's coming on. And he's showing me two coins. So I think you should find coins when you're walking through parking lots or in the grocery store, or whatever that looks like. Uh-huh. He's also talking about too um, with him. So he is he is talking about wanting to live like he, he, he was very fun and young. So I want to say your brother was most likely the life of the party. I can feel that in his energy where he would just light up a room when he walks in. So he's sharing that too. And he does this funny thing. Was there, who was there in the military around him? Did you have a grandfather or somebody in the military? Because he's saluting. There's a salute coming in too. Oh, okay. Well, my, my grandfather was in the, in the Australian army during World War II. Okay. Um, yep. So let me acknowledge him coming in because your your brother is bringing him in because I know we're in the military because he keeps doing this. So he's acknowledging that too. So not only do you have your brother supporting you, you've got grandpa coming in too. Um, and your grandpa's funny because your grandpa just 
has a different view on life. And I think what you're doing right now is almost a little bit like mind blowing for him. Um, but he loves to, I'm going to use the word eavesdrop on these podcasts and these things that you're doing because he is still learning and growing from the other side. And that's really important for you to know. Yeah, he was a real character, my, my granddad. So he, he passed when I was like in my early 20s, but he was just always making fun of everything all the time. He's, he didn't, didn't take life too seriously. Yeah, he's the one who plays with your electricity. So I want to say that um, if you have flickering lights or the radio comes on by itself, I want to connect that to your grandpa. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Does somebody have... Um, well, I don't know. I want to say either like a medal or a ribbon or something that he had because he's he's wanting. I don't know how, what your military uniforms look like, but in the U.S. we have like they have like medals or ribbons that they would wear on um, their shoulder, and he keeps pointing to this. Yeah, I, I I'd have to ask my mom about this. I know that my granddad did have some medals that came from his mm -hmm. time in in, in service. But I'm not sure who they are with. I think they might be with mum. Okay. So he's just acknowledging that too for you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, you know, I, I haven't, it's because my brother's been gone for such a long time. I haven't really like thought about him for, I don't, you know, I don't think about him every day, but it's, I think about him more now, especially when I'm talking to, to mediums. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it's um, it's good to know that you know there's a, there's a way to connect still. Oh, absolutely, uh, and you know everyone can connect. So really, this is a muscle that every human has, and we, and we just start practicing with it. So you can ask him to send you a sign. You can ask him to get your attention in a special way. Maybe you'll see his initials or his birth date somewhere or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it really starts whether we're aware of our loved ones or not, they are aware of us and that connection and that relationship and that love, it absolutely lives on. Okay, so I have a question about um, uh, ETs because it, it, as in extra, extraterrestrial uh, connections. Have you ever had any any um, one coming through who is not of this planet or is from another dimension? You know, I actually have connected to um, yes in other dimensions. I have. I have. I don't usually have that happen during readings, but that will happen for me when I'm in meditation or going to get my own information. Okay, cool. I, I love hearing about this, these sort of things. Yeah, so tell us about that. Okay, so the way that I do mediumship, there's a couple of different ways. I like to compare it to a radio. So I can tune into a specific channel. Um, so if I'm wanting to connect to the angelic channel, I'll go to channel 111. Or if I want to connect to the ET channel, I can go to 103. So I can really guide and direct it. Or if I have somebody who's just like, oh, I don't know, what do you have for me? Then I kind of open up and scan like a radio would scan. So if I'm wanting to connect with a specific energy, let's say Pleiadians or something like that, I actually target that energy. And so it would be like, okay, I'm going into my meditation. And at this meditation, I want to target Pleiadians and I want to see what messages they have for me today. Very often when I'm communicating with ETs, getting messages for them, and this is true for most mediums or channels also, that energy of the ET is still in a body somewhere. They're masters at telepathic communication. So it's not like I'm connecting with one who has died. I'm actually connecting with one that is still in a body somewhere. And one thing that I've found is they all tend to live a lot longer than humans. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, humans you, apparently used to live a lot longer than what we do now. It was like many hundreds of years and it's only been, and then it sort of went, during Egyptian times, it really reduced down to 40 or 50, and now it's a little longer, but we've kind of settled on this, you know, 80-ish 80, 80 period. So I know you've probably had many, many, many experiences that really stand out, but is there any one particular uh, spiritual or supernatural experience that stands out for you that would be interesting to talk about? Mm. Well, there's one reading that I did that was really amazing. And I was reading for this RN and her mom was in hospice dying and she had eight children and she was still working full time. And so when I was in this reading with her, I could just feel her energy was depleted. She was completely body, mind, spirit, just running on empty. And Mother Teresa came in. And at that point in time, I was like, oh, Mother Teresa's here. And she says, she's like, well, I worked with her in Calcutta. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay. 
So Mother Teresa came in and she said to her, she said, I never lost sight of giving like service to myself. She said, if I had, I wouldn't have been able to serve others. And she was really giving this woman this beautiful message about take care of you so that you can help your family, you can help your mom, you can help your patients, but you've got to start with yourself. And I just thought that was so beautiful to have someone like Mother Teresa, who we know is such a giver and helped so many, many, many humans to come through and say, hey, don't forget to take care of you first, because that has to happen before you can help everyone else. So that was one of my favorite readings. Hmm. That's really good advice. I was only just talking to someone about this yesterday, uh, one of my guests, and when I was, uh, so I've got four children. So when my second, so when my daughter, who's my second youngest, was born, this was my new, with my new relationship. So I'd, April and I had just been married. So we've been married seven years now. And I had this real tightness in my throat. It was like this, it wasn't quite pain, but it was, it was even worse than it was really awful. It was real tightness. It, I just, it, it was always there with me from the moment I woke up. I got to the point where I just couldn't wait until I went to sleep because then I would get some relief. There was nothing that could fix it. And I realized that at some point that I thought the right thing to do was it was all about because it was April's first baby. Everything was about, you know, getting in the little cocoon. I had my two other sons as well. And I felt like it wasn't appropriate for me to, you know, even talk about anything, what else I needed, what my sons needed, you know, how we were going to make this all work. And, uh, and in hindsight, that was what was causing this, this not speaking up was causing this real tension and pain in here. And it's like you say, it's like you really have to look out for yourself. And a lot of people don't, a lot of people think that it's, necessary for them just to that they'd be selfish if they have to think about themselves but really it's kind of the opposite we we look after ourselves and meet our own needs then that allows us to give more freely to others absolutely and even when we're talking about our jobs or our passions our hobbies we really want to honor our soul first so you're right we live in a a world where you're taught that's selfish but here's the thing By me following my soul's calling, which is to be a medium, is actually how I help and serve others naturally. So our natural ability to help others comes after we serve ourselves first. Or somebody who's a neurosurgeon or whatever you want to be in this world, right? A baker or whatever. But it's about following the calling of your heart and the passion and the inspiration and serving that first. And by that, you will automatically serve others. Mm. Now, I want to ask you something that I've not asked any of my other guests before. Um, I had this sort of uh, revelation yesterday from what a, a guest said to me that because spirit is in everything, right? You could say God or the universe is within everything. So um, it, whatever it is that you can discuss, there's there's sort of a consciousness to it. And even things like YouTube channels, right? So a, a YouTube channel, I like the, uh, I'm just, this is just coming to my head now. It has its own consciousness and sort of evolution that's going to occur and uh, you could almost say its own needs and wants as well, right? So right. I'm, I'm sitting here going, well, I'm conscious to making sure that I'm actually serving the purpose that the YouTube channel has. Now, I think that I'm going down the right, right road, but I don't really, you know, I don't know for sure and I'm going to have to stumble as I go. But I'm just wondering whether you've had, whether you have any insights for me in, in, with respect to that. Yeah, with your YouTube channel? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to, the one thing that I hear Spirit saying is it's a lot like my near-death experience where it's like just trust the next step, the next step. It is going to come up. It's like the step on the escalator. So I feel like it is going to have, it's a life of its own for lack of a better um, word, but you are the guide or the you are the life guide for that channel is how I'm going to frame you right now. And so it's really going to be about you honoring your connection to spirit and the insights and the whispers and the things that you're feeling pulled to do. Spirit talks to all of us, but it really is usually like that whisper or that pull. It's not usually loud, thundering voices, right? Mm. But with that, I do feel like there's so, so, so much potential for it to grow and it's needed now more than ever. So really the key to it, whenever we're a small business owner or running a YouTube channel or an Instagram page or whatever that is, we need to realize 
those things are running off of our energy. So if you are the run one who it's your page, it's actually going to run off your energy. So when you're feeling inspired, when you're feeling happy, when you're feeling connected, you'll actually watch it thrive more. And I would say this, I have no worries about it. Just keep taking the next step because it feels like it's going to be really great. Mm, just keep taking the next step. That's really useful. Um, what advice would you have for 25 year old Michelle? Oh gosh, I'd say don't take life so seriously. I would also say don't believe everything you've been taught or told or you see on the news. Um, and I would also really want to tell her that even with the most traumatic heart events that would come up in her lifetime, spirit would always bring in the most amazing humans. And that even in those moments where I could not take my next breath, there was always a friend, a family member, someone to love me, to help me, to guide me, and really wanting to remind myself that none of us are ever living this life alone. Not only are we surrounded by humans that are amazing, but we have our angels, our life guides, and our loved ones in spirit too. Awesome. Now, Michelle, people are going to want to ask you questions. Uh, is, are you open to that? And what, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, so um, you can reach me through my website, michelleclare, C-L-A-R-E dot net. And you can shoot me an email or book an appointment, whatever you'd like to do there. All right. And t tell us about what you have going on. Is like what, what sort of services do you have? Have you written any books? And how, how does all that work in case people want to get a brief of that before yeah. they contact you? Yeah, so I do angel readings, life guide readings, connections with loved ones, psychic. I also do medical intuition. So all of those are options. I have just finished my first book. I have a couple agents, um, literary agents that are interested in it. And it's called Emergence of a Medium. It's the longest second emergence of a medium. And it got that title because I asked Spirit, I said, Spirit, how long would you say our life on earth is? You know, when we're talking about the scope of eternity. And Spirit said to me, Michelle, it's just the longest second. So it's titled The Longest Second Emergence of a Medium. And I'm hopeful that'll be coming out within the year. Oh, uh, that's amazing. When your book comes out, you have to get in touch and we'll, we'll have you back on the channel to get an update. Uh, Thank you. I would love that. All right. Now, any, any last messages for people that are watching this video? You know, I just want to remind people that one of our strongest gifts of free will is actually in our perception of situations, right? This is a place where we have free will and we don't exercise it as much as we need to. So really take a moment and think about how you want to see situations that have happened in your life, because we can really look at them in a way that appears to be heavy and drag us down, or we can look at them in ways that make us feel lighter and bring us actually closer to source. So really at the end of the day, Yes, you have free will in your decision making, but the one way to change your life is to really focus on your thoughts and changing them so that you are seeing things from a positive light. And with time, you'll really be able to look at the world that way. Oh, that's really useful. Things happen for us, not to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Michelle, it's been my pleasure to have you on the channel today. Thanks for being my guest. Oh, thank you so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be here.